Okay, so in this video, I'm going to go through the answers to the MGCTA practical. So in this practical, we basically fit a variance components model to the data that allowed us to partition the phenotypic variance into maternal and offspring genetic factors and the covariance between the two. So this is what the model looked like. Um, basically, there was four different variance components, a maternal genetic component, a offspring or a child genetic component, twice the covariance between the two, and then a residual component. And remember, that this is an unconstrained model. So the first thing that we asked you to do was just basically to run the open MX script um, and get some estimates for those variance components. Once you did that, we asked you to um, assess the significance essentially of those different variance components. Now there's a number of ways in which you can do this. So for example, I'm just going to switch to um, my R script for a second. So this is what the output looks like when you run the model, you get estimates of the various variance components there. Um, and also standard errors of those estimates. And so what you could do is you could fit um, a walled test, um, which is basically taking the estimate, dividing by its standard error and evaluating that against a normal distribution. That would be one way to get a handle on the significance of those different variance components. But what we did instead is we essentially fit um, what's called a likelihood ratio test. So basically what we did is we fit this full model with the four variance components, and then we looked at the effect of constraining um, each of the variance components and looking at the difference in fit between these submodels and the base model. So there's a number of different ways in which you can do this. Here's one example. Um, so here, um, this first bit of syntax is essentially um, setting the covariance term to zero. So you can use this OMX set parameters function, which will take your model MX test, um, and it will take the parameter Q um, and it will um, set the value to zero, essentially. So um, in this submodel, it's no longer a free parameter, you're constraining it to zero. Run that submodel, and then you can use the MX compare function, which will um, give you a log likelihood ratio chi-square test comparing the base model with that submodel. And so the different um, exercises in the first part of that script was just basically setting each of these different variance components um, to zero and looking at what effect that had um, on model fit. So I'm not going to go through um, the rest of these statements in detail. It's basically exactly the same as the bit of syntax at the top here. It's just that um, here we're constraining two parameters um, to be zero. So now our arguments have been vectorized, for example. So here we're setting M and Q to zero. Here we're setting G and Q to zero. And here we're setting G, uh, M and Q to zero. So this table shows us the results of this process. So the first row is looking at the values which were actually simulated um, in our simulation in, in the top part of the script. 
So we are simulating all four of these different um, variance components. And when we fit the MGCTA model to these simulated data, um, we get not a bad um, estimate of those different components there. So that all looks pretty reasonable. The last four rows in the table show what happens when we constrain the various variance components. Um, and so you can see that there's actually a, quite a drop in fit between the base model um, and each of these various submodels. You can see the, the drop chi-squared here is pretty massive compared to the degrees of freedom. And so um, the p-values are quite small. So this is telling you that actually we need all these variance components in our model to adequately explain the data. Um, and you know that's a good thing because our simulation um, was under, under that full model. So that all looks pretty good. The last half of your practical um, was fitting a constrained model using a path coefficients formulation. So the variance components formulation that we just talked about, that's unconstrained there, but there is actually an implicit constraint in this system and the path coefficients formulation allows you to to do that, to model that. So um, you're looking at um, a path model um, of the MGCTA framework. Um, and if you do path analysis, you can come up with an expression for the variance of this offspring phenotype. So we've got a component due to maternal genetics, so that's M squared. We've got a component due to the child's genomes, that's C squared, but also H squared as well. So that's this C squared plus H squared term. We've got a component due to the covariance between the maternal genome and the child genome. So that's this M multiplied by a half multiplied by C plus C multiplied by a half multiplied by M. So this MC component and then a residual component due to E squared. So you'll notice under this formulation, when M equals zero, then this variance here on the right, um, the term MC will also be zero as well. You know, M, if M is zero, then MC must be zero as well. Likewise, if C is zero, so there's no genes in the child that are the same as the genes in the mother that affect the phenotype, if C is zero, then the covariance again is going to be zero. So this path coefficients formulation uh, models that implicit constraint in the model. There's a number of different ways that you could fit this model. Here's one example. And so here in the top half of the script, I've just created four parameters, M, C, H, and E for the four different path coefficients that we're interested in. And then this expression in colors is kind of the, the business end of the script. So this bit in red is M squared times the GRM for the mothers. So that's the maternal component. Then this C squared plus H squared multiplied by the beta GRM, which is the child's GRM. So that's the offspring component. Then we've got M times C multiplied by the delta GRM. So that's the covariance between mums and kids. And then E squared multiplied by the identity matrix. That's the residual. And so you can kind of see that this formula here is basically completely analogous to um, that expression for the variance that we worked out using path tracing rules. So here's what it looks like when we fit um, the model, um, the path coefficients formulation to the data. Um, I'm just going to shift 
this um, window up here. Hopefully you can see, you guys can see the entire slide now. Um, so you'll notice that the fit of the two models, the variance components form and the path coefficients form are exactly the same. So that looks good. Um, you'll note that the mean is exactly the same, which is good also, but the estimates differ between the two models. Why is that? Well, that actually makes complete sense, remember, because these estimates down here are path coefficient estimates, whereas the estimates up the top are variance components estimates. And so you can demonstrate that the two models are equipped equivalent just by doing some simple mathematics. So for example, we know that the variance component M should equal M squared. So if we take the estimate for M square it, we get the estimate for the maternal genetic component. And you can do exactly the same thing with the child variance component, the covariance between the two and the residual variance as well. So um, the models match up exactly which is good so is this surprising well perhaps not so we have some nice simulated data where we have um, simulated a nice situation with all four variance components and so perhaps it's not entirely unsurprising that our um, model um, behaves well and we get exactly the same answers for both the unconstrained variance components formulation and the path coefficients formulation. Would this be the case um, in real messy data? Maybe not. And so my advice would be to proceed with caution, maybe fit both flavors of model, have a look at your estimates and see if you can understand what's going on. Um, that's all for me. Thank you very much for listening.